What do you think of when I say the word emo? For many of us, the term is kind of a turn off, eliciting memories of our most embarrassing and angst filled teen years. We remember the aesthetic, the eyeliner, the overgrown fringe, the raw XD speech. But this view of emo is pretty specific and limited, focusing on one particular style and era, and thereby ignoring a whole range of other interesting subgenres and offshoots which have spawned since the birth of emo in the 1980s. One branch of emo that I'm particularly fascinated by is Midwest emo. To understand the origins of Midwest emo, it's good to have a little bit of context about the two larger genres which most influence its sound, emo and math rock. Emo is a subgenre of rock that's known for its emotional and personal lyricism. Emo was originally an alternative style of post-hardcore that emerged in the mid-80s hardcore punk scene, a scene that was largely based in Washington DC. Pioneering emo bands include Rites of Spring and Embrace, and the style was further explored in the 90s by bands like Jimmy Eat World and Weezer. It was in this period that a sector of emo also began branching into the commercial mainstream. Math rock, on the other hand, has always stayed far away from commerciality, and this component is actually integral to its sound. Inspired by 70s progressive rock, the genre is known for its complex rhythmic structures, odd time signatures, and extended or dissonant melodies. It is a genre very much focused on the technical and somewhat mathematic experimentation of music, hence the name math rock. As for instrumentals, math rock is characterized by clean acoustic sounds with an emphasis on non-distorted tapping guitars and prominent drums. The vocals, for their part, are often soft and overshadowed. Key bands in the genre include battles and tiny moving parts. In what will come as no surprise to anyone, Midwest emo grew in prominence in the American Midwest. It was during the mid-90s and it drew major influence from both emo and from math rock. The sound became recognizable for its unconventional guitar riffs and acoustic melodies, which were drawn from math rock, as well as its anguish and heartbroken lyrical narratives and distorted electric backings, which were drawn from emo. Emo had already been softening in sound a fair bit from its hardcore punk roots since its birth, and with the arrival of Midwest emo, the frailty and tenderness of the genre was truly realized. Midwest emo bands started gaining huge traction in this period and building large fan bases, such as American Football, The Promise Ring, Mineral, The Get Up Kids, and Sunny Day Real Estate. Subsequently, many independent music labels noticed this trend and began specializing in the genre. It's not really hard to see why Midwest emo became such a force to be reckoned with by teens and young people in the 90s. Adolescence and the young adult years, for most of us, are incredibly difficult and tumultuous times, filled with many highs and also many lows. Feeling socially inadequate, fearing the unpredictability of the future, dealing with our first loves and our first heartbreaks. These experiences are fundamental in our personal growth, but they are also difficult. The image of the simpler times and the fun-filled freedom of one's teen years is warped by the rosy-tinted glasses of nostalgia, and not in the least an accurate representation of a period that bursts with explosive and polarizing emotions. Midwest emo channels that sorrow, that confusion and angst into a beautifully therapeutic and honest musical form. It's not sugar-coated, the songwriting here often opts for overtness over metaphor, giving a confessional and journal-like nature to the artist's tales of heartbreak and of pain. Heartbreak, after all, is the central theme of the majority of Midwest emo songs. That theme is the core driving force behind arguably the most well-known Midwest emo album of all time, American Football's self-titled debut project from 1999, commonly referred to as LP1. Band frontman Mike Kinsella was moved to work on this album after a painful breakup he had at the age of 17, splitting ways with a girlfriend before going to university. The hurt throughout LP1 is palpable, true and deep and to this day it is considered one of the greatest and most emotionally devastating breakup albums of all time. In the commercial mainstream, however, Midwest emo had lost its appeal by the early 2000s. The soft, introspective indie flame of emo's second wave had seemingly died out, and in its place, emo's hair metal-esque third wave burst the mainstream doors wide open, with black eyeliner and huge studio arrangements leading the charge. Though this wave had its fair share of great releases in its own right, gone was the unfiltered rawness of the 90s, replaced instead by the polished and grandiose of the 2000s. Fueled by Ramen emerged as a record powerhouse for new third wave emo acts, and the highly popular American traveling rock festival Warp Tour also served as a hub for the ever-expanding and radio-friendly scene. Massive bands like Panic at the Disco, Paramore and My Chemical Romance overshadowed any mention of Midwest emo, and the abandoned genre ended up finding solace and support on the internet instead. Throughout online forums, Midwest Emo's loyal fans continued spreading word about the genre and building a deeply passionate underground listening community. 
The allure of some bands and albums grew devoted, almost cult-like followings on the internet, with LP1, and particularly the song Never Meant, leading the charge, beloved and praised throughout online forum boards. Other projects, such as The Promise Ring's Nothing Feels Good and Sunny Day Real Estate's Diary, also generated large and persevering followings online. Many of these bands had already broken up by the early 2000s, but their internet-based fandoms became so fervent that their reunions were constantly speculated and demanded. On top of this, Midwest Emo also became a beloved internet meme for its unique aesthetic. As explained in this Central Times article, the genre has many assorted stereotypes, such as band members that dress nerdy, names of bands that reference sports, and album covers that feature suburban houses. A notable example of the inside jokes that are prolific within the community would be how the house featured on LP1's album cover became one of the most popular photo opportunity locations in Urbana, Illinois. Simultaneously, the mainstream appeal of third wave emo continued growing, with some of the aesthetics crossing over into the world of pop punk. And though eventually the wave dissipated, emo continued to be a commercial force to be reckoned with after its merging with hip-hop in the 2010s. Pioneers like Kanye West, Drake and Kid Cudi helped usher in lyrical vulnerabilities and reflections on heartbreak within rap, themes which are the central core of emo. Over the past decade, many artists who were inspired by these trendsetters have also brought in a wave of sad and dejected emo rap into the mainstream. Artists like Young Lean, Trippy Red, XXXTentacion, Lil Peep, Juice World, and Post Malone carry through the emo ethos of honesty and sentimentality in a large number of their songs. Meanwhile, Midwest emo continued its steady yet low-key presence online throughout the 2000s and into the 2010s. Many bands continued independently releasing work in these years, home recordings which loyal fans would be quick to share and discuss with like-minded listeners online. As third wave stadium emo took center stage, that traditional Midwest sound, as Evan Weiss of Into It Over It puts it, went back into the basement. Through online discussions, debates and memes, however, this more understated style of emo slowly started making a resurgence in popularity in the 2010s. After years of continued allegiance to a non-mainstream sound, these bands were surprisingly starting to gain considerable traction and recognition circa 2013. This revival was what became known as the fourth wave of emo, and its influences lie largely within that 90s sound. And the revival was big, with bands like Modern Baseball, Title Fight, and The World Is A Beautiful Place and I Am No Longer Afraid To Die quickly establishing themselves as prominent names in the scene, and publications which had long dismissed the genre, praising it with rave review after rave review. This fourth wave remains popular today. Emo has gone back to the small scale, leaving the glamorous arena for the nostalgic dormitory, once more finding the honesty and vulnerability it possessed in the 90s. The genre now also dons a sizable audience, as well as commercial and critical appeal, some Midwest emo bands have returned triumphantly in recent years, such as American Football, and other new bands have released albums which are quickly becoming as symbolic, recognisable and culturally beloved as LP1, such as Mom Jean's Best Buds and The Hotelier's Home, like no place is there. We all go through heartache and heartbreak in our lives, and while some music can offer commendable distractions, helping us shift our focus onto optimistic alternatives during tough times, allowing us to dance and sing and be happy, it is also important for there to be a space for a genre like Midwest emo in music, allowing us to feel everything we must feel instead of disassociating ourselves from what makes us human, our emotions. Emo is a genre whose lyrical foundations lie in the themes of love and heartbreak, meaning that at its core it's universally relatable, and the extent to which its popularity has grown in recent years only serves to make those confessional messages more widespread. Life is full of low periods, and we have to go through these periods to grow and develop as people, but there is no reason why we should have to go through them alone. Midwest Emo provides that therapeutic, cathartic, and compassionate company which, at one point or another, we all need.